<laughs> you have any idea how many times I was like searching the word dongle <laughs> to find the best one? It's crazy how many products come up when you search that. It's so much so now that safe search is actually not needed anymore when you're on Google <laughs> when you say the word dongle. <laughs> We're live. I don't know. So it says off air. Still waiting for it. I did not have breakfast this morning, by the way. Also, I don't mind if the live comes on and we're in the middle of a thought. So <laughs> it's true. It's better that way. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Uh oh, it's being weird. Damn you, Hangouts. <sighs> Nothing new there. I know. Take the opportunity to steam my glasses. Huh? ASMR tea drinking. Uh, nothing live. I see nothing. There it is. Oh, it's there? Because our live badge is not, yeah. It's, it's live. Busy. We've got it 102 live. people watching. and waiting. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So the ASMR did the did everyone see the ASMR tea drinking just now? <laughs> yeah. Cheers are the best. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, I'll take everybody's word for it that we are indeed live. I'll tell you what. Why don't I before I even start? Why don't I just doubly confirm for myself as well by pulling it up on my phone? I'll see you later, Bill Burr. And I'll also mute my phone. <laughs> Jules. Yes, we are. We are definitely all recording. This is going to be great for pre pre roll. Um, all right, almost there. Almost there. Yes, there it is. We are definitely live. Yes, I can confirm. <laughs> all right, giving it a little second. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 344 of the weekly from Pocket Now and XDA Developers, recorded on Friday, the 8th of February, 2019, from cellular merger. Oh, that one's a really tough word. From cellular mergers to cameras in your stylus, potentially, it's all the technology that makes us go, and maybe also makes us spy. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Hey, it's Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? Um, I got my tea. Everything is set up. The camera's looking pretty good, so I'm doing all right. Uh, we are not going to have Jaime on the show this week. I gave him a bit of a pass. He has a lot of work to get done before we all, well, a lot of people are heading to New York next week because let's just say there's a lot of stuff that we're going to check out right before Barcelona. So take for that what you will. We do have with us today uh, Brandon Miniman, uh, as Jules wrote in our script. Joining me today is the dad jokiest of dads, Brandon Miniman. <laughs> Hello, I am playing with my new toy this week. Yes. It is a friend, it is a mate, and it is 20, and it's professional, so it's the mate. Oh, that is the pro, okay. It looks a little big in your hands, if you don't mind me saying, but it just, <laughs> it looked like the mate 20 is what I'm trying to That's say. That's what somebody said. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I hear that all the time. Just kidding, I'm sorry. Cut that are you <laughs> are you are you are you enjoying the the phone at the very least the uh, um, wide angle on the rear right um, and then I mean obviously high specs on there I mean our our illustrious guest I'm about to introduce and I have spent a lot of time with the Mate 20 Pro actually we're both big fans of it yeah it's awesome the um, one of the biggest surprises is the super macro mode it's just unbelievable how close mm. you can get yeah indeed. Well, we might get a few thoughts of that from our guest this week. Uh, joining us from uh, New York, Brooklyn in particular, is Board at Work himself, uh, Enabong Ete. How's it going, thank, man? Thank you very much. I finally have my voice back after being sick and celebrating my team winning the Super Bowl yet again. Ah, so beautiful. You notice I'm wearing an LA hat, you know, just a kind of a game winning buzzer beater at uh at uh against the Celtics the other day. Just saying. <laughs> I know you, you gotta take what you gotta get, man. You and know. it was Rondo, just say. <laughs> true. That is true. That's very true. <laughs> well, what happened to your voice? Why did you lose your voice? Was there like a lot of stuff going on over the I was, just I, I was kind of sick last week and over the weekend, and then uh, my voice was already raspy, and then I watched the Super Bowl at a bar with mostly Jets and Giants fans in New York. So mm. it was basically myself, Sam, and, you know, 40 other people who were rooting against the Patriots. I was yelling <laughs> as loud as possible. 
<laughs> I can imagine. That was, I, I will admit, you know, regardless of the outcome, that was actually a pretty good game. Like it was, I was on the edge of my seat most of the time. Yeah, it was a tough defensive battle, but we are here to talk about other things other than football. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, Anabong, as you know, uh, audience has been on the show before. We're so glad to have him back on. Uh, make sure you. you get into the chat as well. I do have the video uh, right here. Jules will also be looking at comments in the chat. Uh, so make sure you let your voices be heard. And we'll go ahead and get into our stories for this week. Um, we're, we have a bit of a, we, we have less stories this week than we typically do. Sometimes we try to really pack everything in, but we decided to sort of get a little bit more casual with the number of stories so we're going to go into a longer form discussion this week so hopefully everybody will have plenty of things to say and we would love to respond to your stuff in the live chat all right so uh one thing that i did want to have jaime talk about had he been on the show was a recent video that he released on pocket now and that was regarding the razor phone 2. Now, I will do a quick synopsis of the video um, you know, in his stead. Uh, basically, Jaime was able to finally come back to the Razer Phone 2 and uh, review it after having it for like three or so months. And to explain to everybody the reason why he hadn't done the full review yet, well, if it was supposed to be a gaming phone, he wanted the most gamer experience he could have on that phone. And it had to do with, in particular, a game controller, the Razer Raiju Mobile, which Jaime and I did receive a few weeks back. I think right around the end of uh, CES, we were actually able to start using the Raiju Mobile. Uh, the Raiju Mobile has a clamp on it, has all of the buttons that you would expect from it. It does have an Xbox layout uh, in terms of where the control sticks are and what the button layout is. Uh, and Jaime was super excited to actually try out games using the controller. Whether or not his experience was what he was expecting, that's a whole different story. Um, the bottom line here is that Android gaming doesn't really have the support for controllers that I think a lot of people were expecting. Uh, but that's also kind of true for PC games. And I was hoping to get some, some thoughts from you, Inabong. Uh, you've used the Razer phone too. You actually are into a lot of gaming. And you have, ha you have used that phone for extensive gaming, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Um... In terms of mobile gaming, which is something I'm trying to get back into, um, even though it's a very big market, it's one that as a gamer, I, I'm not too fond of. It's, you know, there are not many titles that fulfill my experience, but the Razer phone does handle that pretty well. Um, you know, in terms of cooling, in terms of frame rate, especially just, you know, playing the games on the screen and having that really fast refresh rate does wonders. Um, now, I have also done a video on the Raiju controller, and it, it, it's a nice controller. I, I like the concept. It just feels a little bit too heavy for me. Um, mm. When you hold it, the controller itself, uh, without putting a device on there, feels heavy, which is nice until you put a device on there. Then it feels like you always have to tilt it up. You know, you've got this action where your hand's doing this rather than just resting to play. So you've got that with the control itself, um, yeah. but it works well. It works well, plus you've got remappable buttons and all that kind of stuff in there. I think, you know, when you mentioned support for controllers in um, with um, Android games, because Android gaming is just like Android operating system where it is free for all, AKA, you know, Google has not done a good job, I think, in saying this is what gaming should look like on Android. Um, you know, you have to wait per game basis for support. So Fortnite just announced that now they now support controllers for gaming on Android. Um, mm -hmm. I think this was probably last week. So that's, I think that's where a lot of the problem lies because, you know, the way Google handles Android and also maybe gaming in particular is it's kind of like, you know, hey, here's a space, do your thing. And there's not a lot of, you know, fine tuning or control for that because you would think um, controller support was should be baked in, you know, mm -hmm. into, into the OS, kind of like Windows, you know. Um, Windows is pretty easy. If you plug in a USB controller, you're good. You're good to go, whether it's PlayStation, Xbox, or even something like the Raiju. Yeah, and um, the way that I, because I, I did do a, I did, I did my video on the Raiju Mobile, the controller in particular, and what I was trying to, the point I was trying to get across there was that there are a lot of games that support controllers, but what you'll notice about those games is that it's games that make sense. 
for controllers, uh, you know, because you won't have a game like Candy Crush, just like you wouldn't necessarily have a game that's like a full real-time strategy game on PC uh, work really well with a controller. You would probably opt for a mouse and keyboard in that case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's the same on Android. You got to think a little bit about what games actually make complete sense. And even though mobile su uh, controller support apparently is supposed to be coming for Fortnite and PUBG at some point, it may or may not be fully supported at the moment. Um, Brandon, some thoughts from your end, because like, are you are you a big gamer yourself? Um, I wanted to ask Anabang a question because oh, yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to justify the existence of these gaming phones. And he partially answered already. But isn't it true that a gaming phone is a good power user phone, and isn't it also true that a good power user phone is also a good gaming phone? Yeah, I mean that is a very good question because uh, devices like uh, OnePlus, for example, right, which um, in terms of uh, performance is one of the fastest performing Android phones on the market. And when you game with the OnePlus, when it was in the OnePlus 6D with the 845 processor, it was smooth. Um, you didn't, of course, have that fast refresh rate on the um, on the display. I think the problem with gaming phones and gaming on Android is that there are not enough games, at least here, to to fully justify, you know, picking up a gaming phone. So, um, you know, maybe if a gaming phone were priced cheaper, like something like the Shark, for instance, mm -hmm. where you could say it makes more sense because now that's a specifically focused on gaming and its price point is say, let's call it, I don't I can't remember where the Shark was, but let's say it's 500 bucks. Then you can kind of go, okay, all right, I'm buying it specifically because I want, you know, this kind of performance. The other thing too is that it depends on the gaming phone. So like the ROG phone from um, Asus is overclocked um, to give you higher performance and you can overclock uh, performance per game. So games like Fortnite really take advantage of that uh, because you can boost the performance as well as PUBG itself. So those are the kind of things, it's it's the minutia, it's, it's, it's almost similar to gaming laptops in a sense, but at least with laptops and gaming, the performance difference is so different from like an ultrabook that you really want to go with that over um, a gaming phone uh, compared to a high-end phone. So I think right now there's just not enough software to justify that whole, you know, uh, difference. So for yeah, example, oh, if, you were, if you were playing Fortnite on an ROG phone and then you switch to a OnePlus 6T, you're saying you would be able to notice a performance difference that would impact your gameplay? I will be able to notice the refresh rate on the display. That's the go. biggest thing. Um, I, I can I can see the refresh rate difference, and you know it depends on how good you. If you're like me, who is you know terrible at Fortnite, people have seen my gameplay. It doesn't matter. If you're a really good Fortnite player, it it matters a lot mm -hmm. because I think Fortnite is cross cross platform, right? So you're not playing just against. Um, mobile users, right? You're playing against PC users as well. So that refresh rate comes into play because anyone who's playing with a mouse and keyboard is just going to take you out no matter what. It's also a longevity thing too, right? Because something like the uh, ROG phone, like I have in my hands here, there's that peripheral that is a fan. So it keeps it as cool as possible for as long as possible. So there might be some other phones, not necessarily the OnePlus, but there might be phones that actually heat up the longer you play, the more intensively you play, especially if it's plugged in. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there might also be that issue as well. But you, you bring up a good point, um, uh, Brandon, about the different features that might be coming up with gaming phones. Because I know that for myself, when I look at laptops and I want something that is highly productive or is potentially highly productive, I tend to look at gaming laptops first because right. I know that they have the most bells and whistles. Um, so we've had, we've already mentioned a few. We have the Asus ROG, we have the Razer, we have the Black Shark. Uh, there was actually the Nubia at CES. Um, are there any particular... Are there any particular features in a gaming phone that you are really sort of clamoring for? What would be that killer feature that a gaming phone potentially has that you would want out of there? Either of you guys. It's got to be the refresh rate, like Anabong said. I mean, because in terms of like thermal performance and cooling, I think a lot of phones have gotten really good at it. Um, in terms of battery life, a lot of phones have gotten really good at it. Speakers, you know, front facing speakers are kind of a necessity, but a lot of phones have just such loud f speakers now. I mean, that it, it pretty much leaves um, a refresh rate that, mm -hmm. that that makes the difference. That makes a gaming phone a gaming phone for the hardcore players. 
So do you think that like the cooling systems haven't exactly like proven themselves as a killer app or a killer feature rather, I should say? I mean, personally, when I use any one of my phones and I've got a lot around here, they regardless of what I'm doing, they don't heat up like phones used to. They have done, they do a really good job at staying cool. Granted, I'm not playing an hour of Fortnite, but um <laughs> I can't I can't imagine that having a fan on the back of a phone makes a tremendous difference. Mm. But again, I'm, I might be totally wrong about that. Um, I, I think to me, cooling does play. Uh, I think Android phones do a better job because the iPhone does not cool well, uh, even though just, just because the last time I did a gaming video on the iPhone in five minutes, it started just getting warm. Um, Android phones do a better job because most people are now using, you know, uh, liquid cooling or pipe cooling on, you know, the semiconductor. Um, and I think he, uh, with the ROG phone, with the fan, my experience, it's done, it's done well. Uh, I, I think I've played for maybe about 30 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I noticed the difference that it was just, it just felt cooler. Like it, it actually felt like um, a well ventilated PC build where you put your hand in there and it's just like cool air as opposed to just heat from your your thermals you know blowing up so i think that is important but for me it's it's games more than anything else there's yeah. because gaming phones remind me of it, it says hardcore gaming and just like gaming pcs uh the problem is there are no games that take advantage of i mean there are a lot of games on uh, mobile games out there there are new games every day but you don't need a gaming phone for those, right? It's it's tap here, swipe here, do this, do that, as opposed to anything that's pushing the performance, you know, uh, of these of these devices. Uh, especially with the kind of chipsets we're having, we know how good the 845 was. 855 is supposed to have you know much better performance. Apple has a really good chip on theirs too, as well, and, and so is Huawei. And but I don't see games that take full advantage of quote unquote, you know, they say these can replace desktops, but I'm not seeing the performance there mm -hmm. games that can do that. And that's, that's what I want to see. Okay. I, I've, I've made the point a couple of times before that like the, what I, what I find so cool about mobile gaming is that we're getting so many ports of classic games like Final Fantasy games, Dragon Quest, um, or some other good ones, all the Telltale games, you know, RIP to Telltale as a company, but the, um, what I love about that is that I could take a phone and just tell people who are looking to get into any forms of gaming and they want to play some of the classics that you can actually do it on your phone. Like, can you imagine back in the day you could have played Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic on the go? Like that, that, that blows my mind. And I absolutely love that. And that's, and that was kind of the point that I was trying to make that there are some really amazing games that are coming out now on Android. Uh, Ragnarok M is an example. I actually have been playing Asphalt nine. I actually think that's a great game too. Um, and, they're, they are awesome, but don't forget about the classics also because this is like the perfect bed for those kinds of things. Um, just before we get into our next topics, I just have a couple of final thoughts. I wanted to bring up a couple of alternatives. Um, I'll show mine off real quick. And then Enobong, I'm sorry if I didn't tell you about this earlier, but I wanted you to show off that Steel Series um, because I've been getting advertisements for that Steel Series and it looks really dope too. I kind of want to check it out myself. Mm, uh, you should told me. It's somewhere around here. <laughs> you don't have to... Oh, it's it's on the other table. That's okay. Uh, I, mean, to... I, I could I could go grab it. I mean, if you want, okay. While you do that, I'm just going to show off this one here. The uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. This is probably my favorite controller of all time. This is a SNES controller retrofitted with uh, analog sticks that also has shoulder buttons. Everything that you could ask for. At the very least, this is one of the best Switch controllers that you can get. But it works for PC and Android. I'm actually doing my video on this one today. This is the 8-bit Do SF30 Pro. I freaking love this thing. And um, Enabong said earlier that the Raiju Mobile is a little bit beefy. It's a little too chunky. This thing travels. Like, this thing is awesome. I would bring this with me everywhere, especially with this MateBook that I'm using, a really nimble uh, classic gaming setup. Yeah. But then there's this new one, brand new one that just came out that I think looks pretty sick. Yeah, it's the uh, Steel Series controller. Uh, this is it right here. It's a bit dull in terms of look, because it's all it's like, almost like black on black, really. But it's got more of the PlayStation layout, which I'm not the biggest fan. Uh, I'm just used to the opposing layout like that. Uh, it's a comfortable controller to use, though, and you know it's got Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. It's got a USB dongle, which uh, on PC it's best to plug it in via the USB dongle. Uh, you just get 
better response time than Bluetooth. You could have some Bluetooth interference because it's just proprietary Wi-Fi signal. Battery life has been good. And on mobile, it's 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 solid. It works well. It works well on with every PC game I tried. Uh, I think I tried about six games so far. Um, plugged in, it worked well. Mobile as well works pretty good. And um, it 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 also has it doesn't have a cradle like the Raiju. There's mm -hmm. an attachment you can buy. It's I think like ten bucks, which you can use as a cradle. Uh, with it, but I do like the controller so far, and I've been using it on my PC games, even though I can use my Xbox controller. But I'm using it on PC games lately so far. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Brandon. I mean, I know that we're the gamers over here having their little side discussion. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are so lucky that you have the time to play games. Oh, we don't, though. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't we, have, we absolutely time. do not have the time. We just th this is what an enthusiast sounds like when they have or rather a junkie sounds like when they can't get what they want. <laughs> I mean, I'll put it this way. I have Resident Evil 2 installed on my Xbox. Mm. That's it. I'm still was, playing God of War. Uh, let's <laughs> let's never go there. And I just installed the uh, uh, Division 2 beta yesterday. Oh, nice. Nice. I still haven't touched know, it. There was also that I don't want to get too far off topic, but like they also have the um, the new battle royale game that I actually kind of want to try Legend. out. Yeah, it's dope. Should I, I did try it out for uh, ten minutes. I mean, it's free. I mean, how could I not try it? Um, yeah. But yeah, see, this Brandon, this is what gamers sound like when they can't game as much as they want. To. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh man. Okay, so um, I did have a couple of final thoughts on there, but actually, you know what? Why don't we go ahead and move into our next story? Um, so. With all of the games that are coming out on Android and on all of these smartphones, um, they can be rather large. Even classic games like uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic takes up at least two gigabytes of storage. So that might be a bit of an argument that storage is going to be like the next frontier. And apparently, there are already some manufacturers that are creating phones with up to one terabyte of onboard storage. Not even anything uh, that has to do with SD cards or anything like that. This is onboard built-in storage. Now, we've already talked a little bit, I think it was last week or the week before, that the Samsung Galaxy S10 may have this kind of storage option. And we did talk a little bit about how <laughs> if if that actually makes sense or not, uh, we'll we'll, have, we'll rehash that discussion a little bit here. But there was one manufacturer <laughs> uh, called Smart Smartisan. I don't know, even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But I just I mean, allow me to be 12 years old for a second. I, I just thought it was a really funny name. Uh, the name of their phone was the Nut R1. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> what phone are you using? I'm using the Nut. I thought it was funny. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Um, if you were to take the, a phone from this company, which unfortunately is not really around anymore, um, they they had I guess they had too much overhead. Maybe they went too hard, too fast, or, or too too early rather, and they just like used up all of their funds. Um, but potentially, this was a phone that was supposed to be about fourteen hundred dollars with well, a Snapdragon eight forty five, eight gigabytes of RAM, but one terabyte of UFS two point one storage. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of storage. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like they threw a lot at the wall for this phone, and it kind of makes me remember. Do um, you guys remember the Eco? Yeah. I mean, their their whole situation was a little bit different, though, because they did they had a phone, and then they tried a whole lot of other things, and then it ended up being way too much for them. And then, of course, now we have what we have when it comes to the Eco, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but would you have a like? W without even thinking about Samsung potentially doing this with the S10, the as the rumors are true, the many variants of the S10 that might be announced pretty soon, um, would you actually want a phone with that much storage in it? Would it actually? Would you actually use it? Is it something that you would be willing to pay for? It's yes. not. Oh really? Okay. Well, Brandon seems like you had a you had a counterpoint. I'm curious why Anabank says yes, but I was going to yeah. say it's really not intended for us. You know, we take for granted if we want to stream an entire album, we stream it. If we want to, um, you know, download or watch YouTube, we just watch it. But in a lot of parts of the world, data is very expensive and not available and much slower. And so you need to store a lot of stuff locally if you want to have media consumption. So f for a lot of people listening and a lot of people in the US, one terabyte is just completely unnecessary because you can just get stuff from the cloud and stream and download. But for a lot of people in the world, they don't have that luxury. Hmm. I, I kind of agree with you there. I mean, we actually have a comment just now, Andreas Numert, I'm going to say, uh, one terabyte for 8K recording. That's if phones could even do 8K in the first place. Like, we're not quite there yet. 
4K no, recording, no. sure, but how much of that recording are you actually going to do? You know? But anyway, I, I mean, true. I definitely agree with Brandon. Uh, I think that's a very good point. But also here, you think about it. Um, you know, the rumors are that the front-facing camera will do 4K. Uh, the rear camera will do an <sighs> HDR10 recording. Wow. So if you do an HDR10 recording, that's already bigger, just file mm -hmm. size alone. Um, and then you you add in the fact that if if you know we were at uh, Qualcomm's event and they talked about bokeh recording as well. That would be a bigger file size than just regular 4K recording. So already you're looking at things that will just eat up more space. And I, I do like the fact that as a user, I can hold my own content. Uh, that's just how I think in general is that whatever content I want to watch, whether it's something that I have to pre-download or I can record my own stuff, I don't have to ship it to the cloud. I don't have to pass it on. And I think that makes a whole lot of sense for a lot of people. Plus, in my case, I'm a creator, so recording and having enough space is always great. Well, and I agree with you there. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that like is really into vlogging with smartphones. I've actually never, with, with current options in Android, I've never run out of space on a phone to the point where I was actually like kept from creating my content. So I guess I guess for me it's I'm never going to complain for having more. I'm never going to complain that one terabyte's there. And if I do get a one terabyte phone, let's say in the review unit, then fine. I'll try to use it as much as I can. It'll be there. But I just there's this one problem that I have with this whole thing. It's that um, there's this huge price disparity when it comes to storage options in smartphones. You have a company like Samsung that is going to make I mean, their their phones are already famously expensive at this point, but a one terabyte option could be like sixteen hundred dollars, or we don't even know how much it might end up being. Uh, meanwhile, you have two hundred fifty six gigabytes um, of an equivalent type of phone from Samsung that might be a thousand dollars from OnePlus. That's only like six hundred dollars. Like, what is what is justifying the price point for some of these people when we have storage options from like Apple that are also super expensive as well? Like, there's this price disparity that's so crazy to me. And if you want to have the best of the best. It seems weird that we have one terabyte storage options that might be way more expensive than any of the other equivalents. Uh, I think it's simple though. They, they're just building that one terabyte um, fab right now. Uh, according to reports, they just started, which means it's just gonna be expensive um, because this is the first set of one terabyte fabs that are coming out for devices. So Samsung is going, look, we're not going to sell as much one terabyte devices, so we can jack up that price to justify the cost. Most people are going to buy what 256 or you know whatever is that 120 256 price range buffer there. But for those who want it, you know, to me, I would see that you know the reason they also that mentality works well is if you look at what they did with the Galaxy Notes, uh, a lot of people, a lot of Note users probably went with the 512. I'm guessing, because I know a bunch who did, who bought the, because Note users are considered power users and they go, look, I want that storage, I want that use case. It might not work well for the S, S line, but I think, you know, hey, if they're building it right now and they're creating those one terabyte uh, memory fabs, then, it's just going to be expensive because it's the first line that's coming out. The other first one's doing it anyway. No one else is. You know what I find funny is like I feel like these features, including one terabyte hard drives, are going to be things that we see on phones. Phones always get the first thing because I just received uh, one of Huawei's uh, media pads. And it has mid-range specs. And I keep thinking to myself, why don't we put high-end specs in a tablet? or in a different form factor where it might make more sense for the type of niche user that wants to pick that up, who needs that power in that, maybe they don't use it every single day, but when they do use it, they do need that power, they need that storage, they need that media. And I find it funny that this is the kind of stuff that we get on our phones, which end up becoming so expensive, but we never see those features anywhere else. <laughs> What's interesting is that people associate high storage with future proofing for some reason, and they're willing to pay a significant premium you know, they think I'm just going to get a, you know, a tremendous amount of space. For some reason, I might need it in the future. I don't want to have to get a new phone in 18 months, so I'm just, you know, willing to pay a lot for one terabyte. I don't know why I need that, but you know, I'm gonna get. I, it. I might need it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think to your point, Josh, is the fact that, to be honest, the only time you see those kind of big memory jumps are within laptops and cell phones. The two yeah. things you use the most. Tablets just are not that effective because you need to add accessories 
to fully use that tablet. Doesn't matter what mm -hmm. tablet it is. Your cell phone, you pull out of your pocket, you use it right there. Your laptop, you open it, you start doing whatever work you want to do. The tablet as a form factor is one where, even with Apple, right, with the, the new iPad, so many people raved about it, but if you look at people's productivity setups, they are like three dongles, a couple of attachments before you start even doing any work. So yeah, I think true. that's why it makes sense for like laptops and cell phones, because those are the things that immediately you will pick it up and you start using that device and you go, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and, and I see where you're coming from with that. And I do totally agree. It's just, I couldn't, I could not stave away my, my disappointment once I turned on that tablet. I'm like, oh yeah, bigger screen. Oh, <laughs> like what was it? Uh, the, the Kirin 6 hundred or something. I, I, it definitely wasn't the latest one. Um, but yeah, a couple of people in our chats, um, Mark C609 um, is supporting your your thought. Five, five 12 gigabyte Note 9. So there you go. Um, Good even job, though Mark. Had, even though he had a 64 gigabyte uh, Note 8 before that. So big jump up there. Um, our previous commenter, Andreas Numert, hopefully again, I'm saying it right, lossless audio formats, offline title support libraries or title playlist libraries. Um, that's true, like lossless yeah. audio. I've not gotten into it whatsoever. So I, I get that, you know, um, raw file, raw photo file editing, uh, raw, raw photos also, that might be a big thing as long as it becomes an option in more of our cameras. So I get it that there, there is going to be this demand, but I don't feel like most people kind of understand that, at least not yet. But it's up to a company like Samsung to appease literally every type of user. So I guess that kind of explains it there. Um, all right. so. Wherever the Samsung Galaxy S10 might end up, uh, it might be on any, pretty much every carrier. I mean, that's the case when it comes to Samsung. But there might be one less that Samsung uh, has to worry about, or at least over the next three years, because there's a bit of a merger that's supposed to be happening. T-Mobile and Sprint are on their way to become one entity. And from the article that is over at pocketnow.com, uh, what I notice here is that um, they're calling it the new T-Mobile. So I'm like, okay, fine. Like, that's fine. Just keep... Sprint's just going to like go by the wayside. Uh, but one thing uh, that is great about this is that John Legere, who I think has done some great stuff during the uncarrier era of T-Mobile, has pretty much said that over the next three years, which is potentially how long it will take for these two carriers to actually merge properly, um, led, Ledger, Ledger, as Jules is, okay, J John Ledger, we all, I, I kept hearing Legere. Um, anyway, so... Even though, de even though a decrease in competition in the general carrier market might mean that prices actually go up, uh, what John, I'll just say John, is trying to do is freeze prices to where they are right now for any customers that are on Sprint and customers that are on T-Mobile so that over the next three years while the merger is actually happening, uh, their prices are not going to go up as a result of all of it. Uh, so one thing I want to ask real quick is doesn't you we all saw the uncarrier stuff happening um, I remember there was one story that I have uh, when the first two uncarrier moves actually happened I think it was binge on uh, I actually got to go to a concert that T-Mobile put up and it was Zed Little John and Bruno Mars I can't I, I was actually super happy that I got to go to that one at the LA uh, amphitheater it was so awesome um, they've been doing some pretty awesome stuff and I want to get some thoughts from you guys about like where T-Mobile has gone uh, what they've done to like change the carrier landscape what carriers are you on even uh, and Vong and Brandon I am on AT&T really okay I'm on T-Mobile okay so you're on T-Mobile I'm, I'm yeah. the only one who has fully converted to Google Fi I guess I mean, as much as I love T-Mobile, I mean, I just couldn't justify having two different lines. Um, but okay, so with AT&T being your carrier, Brandon, like, have you seen? Have you have you as a customer outside of what T-Mobile has been doing? Have you? Has it been enviable in in any fashion? Like, have any of the things that T-Mobile has done as the uncarrier um, like made you want to jump ship? Absolutely, and I kind of lost track of all the stuff they were doing. I, I, <laughs> I tend to remember there was like unlimited music streaming. There was just so many little things. Um, and T-Mobile is less expensive if you compare it apples to apples with AT&T. Um, a while ago, T-Mobile had this test drive where they would send you an iPhone 5S 
and you could use it for several weeks and see like, you know, how data speeds were and how call quality was. Because before that, T-Mobile had a poor uh, reputation in terms of reliability. So I did the test drive and I was like, hmm, T-Mobile is less expensive. Let me see how the coverage is. And I kid you not, in this area, in Southeast Pennsylvania, most of the time T-Mobile did not work indoors, which is, you know, kind of a problem <laughs> because I'm a human being and I go inside sometimes. So um, it was a non-starter. I'm sure it's gotten better since then, but I, I would love to switch to T-Mobile. I could probably save hundreds a year, but I stay with AT&T because their, their coverage here is bulletproof. Yeah, I know the coverage thing is always a question. Uh, that was the reason why I was on Verizon for a certain amount of time. Even being in even being in Greater LA, like coverage was very spotty for both AT and T and T Mobile, which is why Verizon will always kind of have a soft spot for me in terms of just their overall LTE coverage. But in your case, Anabong, being in like Metro, like New York City, isn't T Mobile kind of king out there? Yeah, T Mobile is is Lord and and reigns supreme <laughs> in New York. This is the era of this uh, bunkers. I've been a T Mobile customer since two thousand and three. Um, I used to be a Sprint customer, and I left after um, some uselessness with Sprint. Uh, but you know, uh, Brandon's right. T-Mobile's had its its rough days. Um, one of the things they did was when they eventually did their full 4G rollout instead of just HSPA Plus, is they did it the right way uh, by doing a, basically by going four by four MIMO. And the biggest thing now that has helped them is they now have a 600 megahertz um, bandwidth. So that, of course, because basically the, the reason why it just didn't work in apartments is because higher bandwidth is almost like just call it high levels. It's higher in the cloud and it's lower. Plus, when they buy uh, sprints and get all that Y max bandwidth for 5G, it would be insane. That's what they're going for. That's really why they want Sprint because they've just got this bundle of stuff, not necessarily the customers, but they've got that bandwidth that they can push. Now, in terms of all the benefits, um, as a T-Mobile customer now, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of customary to just expect something new from them, um, <laughs> you know, because I, I can stream Netflix for free uh, without using any of my data. I can stream my music as well. Um, I the other benefit is is um, if I'm flying on any airline that uses Google Wi-Fi, I don't have to pay. I can just connect with. Uh, T-Mobile. I miss that. Actually. And it's, it says it says only text. You can send text messages uh, to people, but you actually can browse the web. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just a quick cheat for anyone. You just basically log in with your T-Mobile <laughs> and you can browse the web with it. So those nice. kind of things uh, they've done well. And of course, they've got like the T-Mobile Tuesday, whether you get to win stuff, uh, discounts of movie tickets. I think they've done a lot of things to ensure that even though they've had gaps in service in certain areas, uh, that customers feel very welcome, which is plus again, you're looking at the price um, uh, that they actually portray. But in places like New York, I used to live in Boston, um, T-Mobile has just been really good uh, in terms of service where uh, my AT&T, for instance, my gigabit LTE speeds here, I get up to, my highest I've got is about 220, I think, in New York um, uh, for downloads, uploads around 100. How much How much do you pay and how many? How much data do you have for that price? Uh, I've got an older plan. I pay 70 bucks unlimited. Uh, oh, yeah. That was what I used to pay too. Yeah. I've I've got that old. I mean, my old old plan was like fifty bucks unlimited. I wish I still had that one, but wow. um, it's seventy bucks unlimited data. And um, the only thing that's capped is my tethering, which is mm, yeah. ten gigs. Yeah, I think I remember. I think that was exactly the plan that I used to have before. We have yeah. a lot of people in the chat talking a little bit about. Um, carriers abroad and i wish I, the, if there was one thing that I, I do wish jaime was here for was the discussion on that because i wanted to hear what carriers are like out in honduras which is obviously where he is right now um but if i could just shine a little bit of a light on what it's like outside of the us i do know that carrier incentives like what t-mobile is trying to do with the uncarrier movement and all that stuff is actually really common in many other countries like for example in now i'm not going to get into any of the actual like socio political like implications of this but there are carriers in the philippines that will literally 
give you free data. You don't have to pay for anything if you're only browsing Facebook. Um, so we don't we don't have to get deeper into that, but I'm just saying that that is a thing. <laughs> so carrier incentives are not are nothing new. They're kind of new to the U.S. I will admit. Uh, T-Mobile is kind of pioneering all of that. But one last question before we get into our break, before we get to our last couple stories after the break, um, do you get any worries about monopolies with this with this kind of stuff? You know, because we're we're seeing the loss of an old old company like Sprint being merged into something, and now it's going to be T-Mobile, an even bigger company after that. Does that does, does monopoly or uh, antitrust stuff ever worry you guys with this? I mean, I think in my case it does because you only have now you've just got a big three, right? You've got mm -hmm. T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT and T, and you know who's to say that they can't come together to, you know, set things a certain way, especially with five G coming, because. You know, I remember when we, uh, I don't think you were there, but I was at Qualcomm and they were talking about 5G and how it is cost saving for carriers. Mm -hmm. um, the the way they, they explained and did a breakdown was like, hey, look, because of this, you know, just one aspect of 5G is the speeds, because of how fast it is, it, you know, the fact that you can go in and download that one gigabyte movie or two gigabyte movie from Netflix so quickly and get off the network allows for other people to jump on. So it literally is streamlined, streamlined the process for the carriers and uh, they should actually be spending less money. But we do know very well that that's not going to happen. And again, with the kind of bandwidth that 5G produces, are we going to see that switch to um, you know home style internet pricing or are they going to now give us different weird tiers? Now this becomes harder when you only have three companies instead of four, or you know more companies that provide competition, where it's mm. just now three. Where you know if AT and T sets a price that is somewhat okay, Verizon will just match, and then T-Mobile might just offer slightly less. You know, even though it's not necessarily price fixing, but now you just got this thing where all the prices are somewhat similar and not necessarily. Um, anything worth jumping or saying, oh, I've got a really good deal here, I can move. Mm. Any uh, final thoughts from you, Brandon, before we get to our break? Yeah, um, I was going to say it does concern me uh, about monopolies in this industry because unlike any other industry, it's not welcoming to competition because you can't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to start a carrier. You'll need tens, hundreds of billions of dollars. And it's just like, it's basically not possible in other industries you know, whether it's mobile phone operating systems or PC hardware or really anything else, if you really wanted to, you could get into an industry if you had enough funding. But to to create a carrier to compete with AT&T and Verizon is quite literally impossible. And so it does make me nervous that these guys with the big power will have too much power and not the benefits of a market economy where other people can come in and compete yeah i agree uh the uh we're, we're gonna see we're gonna have to see what happens i mean even then after um after three years we don't know what's going to happen i'm just going to be a bit of a pessimist and say probably the prices are going to go up anyway in three years but at least until then you might have the prices be where they are um you're right though brandon like the, people can't just wake up and just like try to become a carrier like there was literally one business here i just want to this is funny this is why i just want to say it real quick there was one business here that tried to open up to give uh fiber internet to people um they called giggle fiber <laughs> <laughs> that that building is now a donut shop. Let me just say that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into our break before we get to our last couple of stories. The Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Swappa, where you can browse from a huge collection of gently used tough phones. Sorry, let me do that one more time. The Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Swappa, where you can browse from a huge collection of gently used phones, all at prices significantly lower than you'd pay for them new. Every phone on Swappa is in very good condition with no screen damage, are certified to have clean ESNs, and ship for free. Browse for your next phone at Swappa.com. All right, Brandon, uh, I know that you have, uh, as usual, you have to get out of here in a few minutes. So I just wanted to check in with you real quick. Um, we do have a couple of stories that are coming up. But if you have any general thoughts that you wanted to share with us, go for it now. Hmm. Because um, if, if not, I have questions pertaining to the last two stories that I want you to answer. 
Okay. Um, just trying to think if there's anything I want to say about the Mate 20 Pro because I've been. Oh, yeah. Um, what amazes me about just a couple of test notes about the Mate 20 Pro is how how small it is relative to its screen size. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. and I have small hands and it just, it feels so good that it's just such a good phone. Um, really everything about it. I think the, like, you know, everyone praises the heck out of this phone, especially Jaime. And I could see why. <laughs> It's it's blisteringly fast. The hardware is impeccable. The charging is unbelievably fast. The camera, you can do so many creative things with it. I'm really glad I got it. I could see why people love it so much. So I'm really, I've been really um, happy to try something different in the last week. So, yeah. yeah. Have you been spending a lot of time with that wide angle camera? Like, is this the first wide angle that you've used, or it can't be, huh? I've used uh, the wide angle on LG phones. I think I it's. Got it. I think it's great. I mean, wide angle should be standard on every phone, and it's probably going to be. <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts on EMUI, actually? Because I know the software tends to be a polarizing feature. Um, I really don't like it, uh, but, <laughs> but like it's forgive it's forgivable because it's clean and light, and it feels a little bit like iOS, but you know, it's nice. And they did a good job with the gesture system. It's not as good as OnePlus, but it's pretty damn close, and. Mm. Uh, you know, it's colorful and I mean, it's just fast. So you kind of forget about the iOS ness of it. Yeah. I got to say, I'm, I'm really excited to see what Huawei has to bring to MWC, especially after the Mate 20 Pro has, like, you know, just really wowed so many people. I mean, I've, we clearly have a P series phone that's supposed to be coming up. So I wonder what they're going to bring out the woodwork there. Um, Anyway, you have a few minutes left, so I do want to ask you a couple of quick questions, and then we're going to expound upon them uh, while Enabong and I uh, do the last two stories. So, okay, the last two stories that we have, uh, the chat has been going crazy about it already. Yes, there is this idea that the S Pen is going to have some sort of camera in it. There's a patent that Samsung was just granted that would potentially put a camera inside of that little stylus. Um, <laughs> Harkening back to all of the James Bond slash Super Spy stuff, like, would you actually want a camera in your S Pen, Brandon? Because <laughs> you you were a fan of the Note Nine for a bit. I remember. Would a camera actually add to that experience? Um, if they can get the optics right and the battery life, I think it would be actually really cool because you can take it anywhere that a phone might be too cumbersome to take. So think of like a concert or like a family event just to take, you know, a camera in your pocket that's the shape of a pen. I mean, it's <coughs> super lightweight. Um, you'll probably, I mean, if it's any good, which probably won't be because how do you fit good optics in there? If it's any good, you'll be taking more pictures with it because you can take, you can put it around your neck as a lanyard or stick it in, you know, in your jeans, you have that little second pocket, you could stick it in there. And it's just more, more opportunities to take pictures if you don't have to lug around your, you know, your your regular you know six point five inch screen phone. Well, okay, and you know what? Now that you brought up all those points, we'll just get into the greater discussion, and then Brandon, you can you can pop out whenever you need. But like you just talked about all of these scenarios where a camera inside of a really easily pocketable pen would work. But what situations would you actually want to take a picture <laughs> using an S Pen like that? Like that's my question. I'm 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 a little bit flabbergasted as to why Samsung would even think that this is a practical feature. Situations where you don't want to lug around your phone. Let's say you're going on a jog, and uh, you you take your S Pen on the jog for some reason, and um, <laughs> maybe you see like a nice mountain or something, and you didn't bring your your you know your your phablet phone essentially because it, it jostles around in your pocket while you run. So yeah. anyway, I'm going to drop off there, guys. Go for it. Um, all right. I'm, Thanks for I'm doing that. that. See you later, guys. All right. So Enabong, S Pen, camera. Actually, you know what? Before we get into that, any any general thoughts you wanted to share to like check in? Because we haven't seen you in a bit. Um, oh, well, let me ask you the S Pen one because it's just it's, it's still in my head. Go for um, it. Yeah, the, the camera is not for taking photos. It's for better. Um, <laughs> It's better optic uh, coordination with the tactile screen on the on the display, so you can actually write better. It's got it's basically position point um, sensing. So I it's going to be pointing towards the tip. 
so that it can see. Yeah. That's what the camera is for. I mean, but wait, is that right. really? Is that an application I mean, that's actually is, has that actually happened in? No, no one's done it. So I just want to see <laughs> what it is. But because you're not going to be able to fit any sensor size that is worth a dime, uh, in that S Pen. Yeah. That says. So th that's why it's best for that because it's all about. It's basically the camera, or it may not even be a camera. It might be that camera sensor that is literally just on, understanding where it is in touching the screen, pressure point, writing, uh, when you lift off, those kind of calculations so that as you're writing, you be you, you should be getting smoother writing strokes or drawing more precision besides all the pressure points as well. Okay. Well, and, you may never use it because they just we officially granted this patent and it's, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, we have months and months before the note is even announced, so we don't even know what the S Pen is going to be like. But the thing that makes me sad, if you look at this patent diagram, where's the clicky top? Like, that's by far the best part about the S Pen. I don't see no clicky top on here, so I'm, I'm actually really disappointed. 10A. 10A. No, that says light entering unit, though. Like... And and it doesn't it doesn't seem to come up, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, but also again, this flat. if you look at the patent image, and this is from the Galaxy Note what five? That well, that that particular diagram, yeah, fig, Figure Four B, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah Figure Four B, yeah. So again, the patent was just officially granted. Doesn't mean that this is it, or it will come, or this is how it will look like. Mm -hmm. It's just what they're trying. I mean, at least what they're trying to do. But I think again. It just all depends. It depends on you know um, what it will be used for, and I think we'll have to just wait and see. But I don't think this is something that um, you know uh, is is for taking photos that way. You know. Wow. I mean, Jules is as incredulous, like because um, he's saying in the chat here that the S Pen already seems good enough on its own, but obviously putting a camera in it would make some noise. And obviously, people, all these companies want to be as newsworthy as possible every time the cycle comes out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, th it's weird because like, okay, so Jules has the, uh, the the patent diagram up there right now. The The optical system seems to be pointing outward. It's not like you hold it like a I don't have a pen on me, but oh, so yeah, like, it's, it's 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 this right, it's the flat side, right? Like so it's it's this side, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm pointing that way to take a photo, right? Oh no, I, well I thought it would looked a little bit more like the neuralizer from Men in Black, where it's holding. Yeah. Oh, like, oh yeah. So, so this way to take a yeah. photo. Yeah. I mean, I guess. <laughs> Which is why they might have had to take right. away the clicky bit. But I mean. Yeah, I mean, what what would even use that for? Like, aside from just like the 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 like, hey, look, I got a camera. Yeah, that's I mean, it. I mean, when it was the Note Five, this would have been cool because it's just saying that oh, now I've got something and I can, I can take a photo. Or, but again, it's a patent. Like everybody gets patents approved, you know, every day. And it's, I don't, I don't, I don't think this is something they will throw in, just because. What I think we know is coming out in the Galaxy S10 um, that is going to be transferred to the Note is a lot. It's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that you know having that camera there, plus the, the cameras that are going to be on the S10 are going to be just so improved, which would be the same camera system on the Note with you know slight improvements. What's mm -hmm. the point of having this? I think they were just granted a patent, and then everybody's just overthinking it. That's a, yeah, probably, but that that is that is kind of part of our job descriptions yeah. being in the <laughs> tech industry. Um, <laughs> but also, um, there are a couple of people in the chat, and they're bringing up some pretty interesting points. Um, if the S Pen, oh, sorry, Frank, uh, blah, 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 can't even speak right now. Frank Clow Clowen, if the S Pen cam will kill the front cam, then let's go for it. No cutout for the screen would be nice. But like you would take out the S Pen to take a selfie. Yeah. Like <laughs> so it's either you do this or you do. Hey, hey, hey hold up a second. Hold up. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> this. That's yeah. that's where the you know I mean that's already too much work. By the way, did everybody see that just now? Did everybody see Anabong with that weird flex just now? He just showed off that super special Note Nine in his hand right oh, now. Oh, you mean this one? This yeah, one, yeah no, one of I, the only people we know who has the Casey Neistat edition. I wasn't trying to flex at all. I was just, <laughs> it's just what I use. This is my daily driver. So I, I don't blame you. I don't blame yeah. you whatsoever. That's such a cool yeah. Supreme Note 9. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Jules. Yeah. No, um, you were asking what I wanted to talk about that was in, uh, 
the one yeah, thing for, we have one out, more story after this so yeah go for it if you have anything um, general you want to talk about a uh, story that came out that said microsoft is looking to put xbox live on uh, ios android and the switch and it, it harkens mm. to what they're trying to do this year which again is low writing you know, so we we have streaming game services the shadow which i have to, i want to check out which allows you to play on your pc your smartphone supposedly uh we've got nvidia nvidia's streaming service that allows you to do that as well um but nvidia's is only you know per pc you can so i can stream um i tried that out and i had a video where i played um excuse me, Call of Duty World War II on a uh, MacBook Air. And I was doing wow. 180 frames per second at 1080p. Um, so Microsoft is trying to do the same thing because word is this year, they're going to release a streaming Xbox. Oh. That would be about a hundred bucks that you can stream all your games directly to it. And, you know, with everything that's going on, this is this is this very big strategy that Satya Nadella had is, you know, we build out our cloud service, Azure. Right now, you know, cloud is big for Microsoft. A lot of game developers are using Azure servers for their game development and cross-platform play. So the reason why we've had this big boom of cross-platform play is because it comes from Microsoft servers. So Microsoft is owning that. So mm. if you look at the strategy, if they're owning that, then releasing a streaming Xbox makes a lot of sense now. And then you add to the fact that if I can now play now, we talked about gaming phones. If I can now play those Xbox games on a Razer phone or something like that on mm. the go and continue from where I stopped at home is even better. Yeah. You know? And I think that's uh, to be interesting thing to see. So this is what uh, uh, Sony tried to do this with the PlayStation Now service, didn't they? And well, not not that they had a streaming, but they did the PlayStation yeah, TV. Stream, yeah, no, they no, they do have a streaming service. Uh, no stream service. You can stream your PlayStation game um, from home to mm -hmm. a laptop. Exactly. Anywhere. Xbox can only do streaming within the home, so I can stream from my Xbox. Say. Uh, I'm playing Resident Evil and say uh, I have someone watching, t one wants to watch TV, I can stream it to my PC here and, you know, continue to game. Uh, so you can do it in-home, but this is not just in-home, this is in-home, any device. This is why they want to move Xbox Live to as many, even the Switch, as many devices as possible. Mm. And I, it's a very interesting strategy of saying, forget the hardware race. Um, software is where it's going to be at right and not just software and titles but software and how you deliver those titles i agree um then and that's a great prospect i mean that, it, it would be the way to actually and, and this is the reason why it's genius is because that would actually be the way for me to get into xbox stuff i've never been an xbox player but if it was that accessible maybe a subscription service, something like that. Maybe I would actually do it. Oh, they already have a subscription service too. <laughs> <laughs> it's but funny, you, they have yeah. an Xbox subscription service where it's uh, $20 a month for Xbox One S plus Xbox uh -huh. Live. And then I think it's $40 a month. I could be wrong. Uh, somebody would correct me for the Xbox One X. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see. So when they started that, a lot of people were kind of like, oh, why? I'm like, this is their plan to to get you to just subscribe to the streaming box. It's 100 bucks. You either pay for that immediately and mm -hmm. you're done. And then you pay like $20 a month um, for for all access to Xbox games. So it sounds like you're kind of into this like potential future of ours where like, let's say you have a low end PC but you have the streaming service and great internet. You could still play AAA titles. Yeah, I mean, you play AAA titles at 1080p. I mean, mm -hmm. me personally, I would still have the Xbox that does the 8K at home, because I have to. But um, but I think for everyone else, like you said, for, for someone like you, you can now go, hmm, okay, yeah, I'll get the streaming box to play the Xbox, no problem. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. I'll just pay the $20 a month and I can play on my phone, I can play on my, uh, my laptop, and it doesn't matter what laptop I have at this point now, right? Because you're just streaming. Exactly. You know, I can I can do that, and and then when you're now adding 5G to that whole aspect, you know, down the line, whether it's you know 2021, where at least we we'll probably have most places have 5G by then in the Hopefully. US, um, then being able to play those games is is just a matter of like picking up your phone and going. 
I want to play Gears of War. Bam, <laughs> done. Okay, let's do this. You know, and that's mm -hmm. it's a very interesting place now because as you've seen all these things come together, where it's you know server stuff, five G, mobile devices, you know, all come into like one cohesive um, uh, framework. Yeah, I think I, I'm I'm excited to try it out. And even though I might not be the biggest believer in like, cause you know, you want good quality and also not everybody has really good internet to begin with. So it might not be easy for the streaming service to actually take off for most people that is. Um, um, check out project, um, um, Google also has theirs as well. I, I tried, I, I tried to sign up. They never, they never invited me in. So. Oh, I got the invite. <laughs> I, I used three different Google accounts and I signed up nothing. I was so mad. Wow. Did you use, <laughs> did you, use, did you use the one for your uh, YouTube account? Because that's what yeah. I used. Okay. Yeah. I use um, all of them. I have, I have, I have three, different Gmail, uh, three, uh, three different Gmail email addresses and I use all of them. Nothing. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> I wanted that Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Uh, anyway. Um, okay, so we have one final story, very very light one. I hope everybody has enjoyed the, sh the the show so far. As we kind of we 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 like I said, we brought down the number of stories because we wanted to make sure that we were actually going into discussions for each of these things, a little bit more focused in terms of the things that we're talking about. But now we're going to get very unfocused. We're about to get very distracted because there are fifty nine new emojis coming out soon. <laughs> It's time to start not talking in English and only talking in tiny pictures that are on our phones. Um, are you an emoji guy at all? I've, I've got into emojis lately. Um, <laughs> I mean, you realize, uh, most people don't realize I am not that young. I may look like super fresh here. Um, but you realize when you have to communicate with, you know, like my cousins, for instance, or, you know, people, if you're talking to people who are younger than you, in, in my case, um, and, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, text, for me, it's it's the it's the um, uh, Urban Dictionary to find out what every abbreviation is. Oh yeah, yeah. So I actually prefer emojis because they are just I, I know what it is. Like I know at least if you if you give me say a hundred emojis, I can automatically look at it and understand ninety percent, ninety five percent immediately, as opposed to somebody just giving me I R K or, or whatever you know short abbreviation, and I'm like. I'm supposed to know that, so I, I, I'm, I'm cool with emojis, but, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of time where we just have to find that balance of like, um, how much is too much. Yes, because that was really my, my thought here was while I'm not going to be, I, I too have only recently gotten to emojis, and it's honestly only because of the person I'm dating. That's really it. Like she uses them. She uses them. Issa Rodriguez over at Gadgetmat. She uses emojis fairly often, and I got into using it more often. Um, and it, I don't even. But I'm very careful with it. I don't try to use. I try not to use emojis in such a way that completely replaces my actual use of language. <laughs> like there are certain things I would use it as a compliment to it. So if I say like "love you, babe," and then there's a kissy face, but it's not just like going to be emojis in one string. There have to be words in everything that I send. Let me just say that. Um, but like, it's funny because people have these opinions when it comes to emojis. People are excited about these emojis. There are actually a couple of really funny articles that came out. One of them is actually a gadget match to give Issa, my girlfriend, a, uh, a shout out here. She put up a, an article saying that there are already a few, <laughs> there are already a few emojis that girls are going to use to, uh, <laughs> to shoot down guys. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious because one of these is called the pinching hand. <laughs> this thing is ridiculous. Pinching hand. It's basically like you going just a little bit, but you can imagine what people are going to use that one. For. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which the I thought yawn. was the Did yawn is funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> oh boy, that 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 emoji is going to take a lot of. Oof. Yeah, there's going to be so many entendres with that. Um, Rocky Grenade in our uh, in our chat just says, "If you don't receive emojis, you're not special." <laughs> <laughs> See how people use these kinds of things because you and I both like um, yes, yes, I'm a, I'm a bit younger than you, but like I still was in the era of the emoticon of the like colon uh, parentheses, you know, like yeah, yeah. yeah. So 
Wait, wait, we, you, uh, we use those all the time. Could you, you scroll down? I just want to see all the emojis. <laughs> There's like people kneeling, right? Is, is that yes. Like, There's that too. Is that prayer or? Yes. Yeah, so I, well, I, 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 I saw it as a... because Yeah. I, w I would say prayer, but somebody would probably say, you know, get on your knees or kneel before Zod or something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, thought, I thought meditation, but okay. But okay, to the left of that, there's also like a uh, blind, blind person walking. I mean, it's cool. Representation is definitely at an all-time high with these. No, I, I get that, but can a blind person actually see the emoji to post it or even read the emoji? Yeah, it, like what situation would that actually make sense, you know? Like when you're trying to describe somebody to a friend of yours, that you know, oh, my friend is blind. For example, wouldn't you just say my friend is blind, or would you actually just send that em that emoji to them and be like, he's this? <laughs> like, how there's a line of respect and disrespect when it comes to using emojis, and obviously that's where some comedy comes from. But like, what is actually the what, why? Why? What's the I, purpose? <laughs> I, I am. I mean, you know, I I I like the prosthetics, but you know, I, it's cool that they have wheelchair and power wheelchairs. Like, yo. I upgraded. <laughs> There's also a chair, just a brown chair. <laughs> yeah. It's way to the right. And then um, stethoscope, okay, fine. I personally am a fan of the waffle, but I think donut is way better than waffle. And then there's a there's a butter emoji, which I'm actually really happy about. Hashtag keto. Um, but <laughs> uh, even the butter one has so many connotations already. Ah, can... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just so funny to me. And then there's even one here that I, I don't even know what it is. Like, is that a pearl? Oh, that's a clam with a pearl. Okay, never mind. Um, there's a melting piece of ice. Like, you know, and it's just funny. Like, to yeah, anybody that's, what it, that's what it means. What does? I said, stop sweating. No, you can't take the heat. Oh, okay, that's true. So like emojis like the 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 digital it's digital slang which is fine. Do you have any emoji that you always go to though? Like is there one that you always use all the time? Uh, I mean, it's laugh out loud. I laugh a lot, so it's like you know, that's pretty that's much true. it. The, that's the crying the crying one, right? Crying one, yeah. Uh, it's pretty much my my go to emoji, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then like facepalm because people do a lot of foolish things. Uh, well, that's when the yawn emoji is going to come in, and then <laughs> like when, just imagine the amount of shade on Twitter that people are going to be able to give with this kind of stuff. So, wait, mean, wait, who makes emo? Like, who's the emoji? Like, is there like emoji uh, um, organization that everybody yeah, has? The, Uni the Unicode organization. Um, uh, okay, all right. Yeah, I, had, I had no official idea. Unicode, yeah, I had um, no idea. it's. It's such a throwaway term because, like, you you use your computer, you see the word Unicode, and you're like, "Oh, that's just what it's writing with." But no, it's an actual like conglomerate, not conglomerate, like or like association or organization or something, you know? Um, multinational lobbying group featuring tech companies and Bahrain and some other countries, as Jules is saying in our chat. Um, yeah, probably the only one out of all of these new ones that I would use very often as a sloth, because if someone's like, "Hey, did you get up yet?" I'm a sloth. <laughs> Did you get any work done yet, sloth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's probably what I would use. It's like, I'm just chilling right now. I'm chilling. Sloth. <laughs> sloth chair. Um, <laughs> all right. So let us know what you think about all of these emojis uh, using the hashtag PN Weekly as well. Uh, we have some people in the. Uh, we have some. We actually have people in our live chat right now having discussions about how young or how old other people are. <laughs> Which is hilarious because this is really funny about oh, really? how emojis make this happen. Yeah. I remember when I was four back in 2008. Damn. <laughs> I, I never use emojis even though I'm 14. My goodness. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy how, how our language, our digital language has been evolving over the years. But you know what? It's on that note that we're going to go ahead and call it on this one. Um, our theme music is Bloom by Minerva, courtesy of a royalty-free license with Argo Fox. You can learn more about that in the episode's description. From our crew, you can follow them on Twitter. Our producer extraordinaire, Jules Wong, is at Point Jules. Brandon is at Brandon Mini Man. And... Jaime, um, I will still say, even though he wasn't here, he's at Jaime underscore Devetta. You can look forward to his daily tonight and also the daily recap tomorrow. I am, of course, JV Tech Tea. You know me. I'm JV. I love tech, and I love to drink me some tea, as I have been this entire show. Pocket Now is on Pocket Now at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube in English and Espanol, where you can find more news on the Pocket Now Daily and Pocket Now Adadio. Uh, I also made a mistake. 
and a bong is found at Board at Work. <laughs> Thunder E here. Um, I was reading. I was reading straight through the script. Uh, board at Work is spelled with two O's: B O O R E D A T W O R K. So two O's in board. There you go. Sorry about that. In a bong, I got too into the script. I'm like I'm like Ron Burgundy. I just keep reading the script. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, good to know. I'll feed you lines next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can catch up on what the weekly is talking about at pocketnow.com slash podcast. Also, make sure you make your voices heard by emailing us, podcast at pocketnow.com. I also really do invite everybody to try and uh, really email us because uh, we want to start actually responding to people's responses. And if you have some really well thought out responses to our podcast that you email to us at podcast at pocketnow.com, we might actually read them on the air. So I want to make sure that we get that going as well. We would also certainly appreciate your feedback through reviews and ratings on Google, Apple, Spotify, Overcast, and appreciate uh, wherever you might be streaming us because without you we wouldn't have been able to make this show for your eyes and ears for seven years straight um fun fact actually i brought up the ron burgundy thing uh he said in an interview once that he is a torero as in he went to the university of san diego so did i so <laughs> we are we are one of kin um so with that in mind we're gonna go ahead and uh, call it on this one thank you so much for watching and as jules just wrote as quickly as he could, go tuck yourself, <laughs> San Diego. <laughs> stay classy. And stay classy, San Diego. Stay, stay classy, everybody in the podcast first, and we will see you next time.